Hello everyone, welcome to another video of Into the Hive Mind. Uh, this one I wanted to talk about Cali the California Cup or Cali Cup, um, obviously held in California. We were way down south uh, playing, hosted by the Xenos Petting Zoo, Stephen Corrales, uh, absolutely incredible event. Um, nine rounds, it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event, three rounds each day. And I ended up winning Best Tyranids, which is super exciting as there were some extremely talented Tyranid players at the event. Um, so yeah, just wanted to let you guys know, sorry this video is so late. I meant to make this like three weeks ago, but kids, so <laughs> been pretty busy. And uh, yeah, so let's dive into it. Let's go over what my list was. Um, so I had previously, I will be making another video uh, right after this about a GT I attended two weeks prior uh, in my hometown of Denver. And in that one, I ran the Vanguard detachment and I absolutely loved it. But for the Cali Cup, for FAQs and stuff, they ruled um, that you cannot basically use the free strat for uh, making your enemy take battle shock checks because it targeted a friendly and an enemy, which is multiple units. Therefore, you cannot use it for free. Um, I think that's really lame, but it's because I want to use my strat, and that's kind of how the whole army worked. Um, absolutely love the list. Like I said, I'll be making another video going over that. But because of that, um, I ended up switching to just a invasion fleet uh, for this event, and no Hive Tyrant at all, as they even ruled that you could not use the free strat for a CP reroll, as it did not target a unit. Um, it's their ruling, their judge. Like I said, Steven Corrales is an incredible guy. Um, we went out because it's a bunch of friends and a bunch of great people out there and absolutely top level play. Uh, so nothing against them, but for this event, it did make it where Hive Tyrants are practically useless. Um, so I didn't have one. And yeah, so I just brought a straight invasion fleet. And what I was running is Death Leaper, supported by three Neurolictors. Um, this little package is just kind of in every single list I've made now. Being able to basically battle shock, get plus one to wound is so important for Tyranids being, you know, max strength eight or nine, uh, pretty much everywhere. Getting that plus one to wound can help really offset that massive weakness that we have. So Death Leaper with three Neural Lictors is basically just in every list I write now. Um, and then we get to spicy stuff almost instantly. So I have two winged Tyranid Primes. Obviously these will be joining melee Tyranid Warriors. Uh, these guys in this detachment are actually incredible um, and nobody's running them, but the Adrenal Surge Stratagem for two CP gives both units uh, critically hit on fives in melee and Turns out if you have a winged Tyranid Prime, you chose lethal hits against vehicles, um, and then you spend two CP, both of these units can suddenly hit on threes, rerolling ones, critically hitting on fives with both lethal and sustained. And they can pick up like, I don't know, a Yinkarn, um, a Redemptor Dreadnought, stuff that Tyranids normally cannot kill. But turns out when you lethal hit on fives and your twin linked and sustained hits fives with 42 attacks, it, it gets really good and it just kind of kills everything. Um, especially if they're plus one to wound, then they really kill anything. But otherwise, I mean, even without it, uh, they actually can kill pretty spicy stuff. Um, all right, so then moving into the rest of the list. We have uh, Biovore. I mean, that's just standard again in every single list. You make your spore mine, you get your secondaries. Moving on. Uh, then I have three Exocrine. Um, they're just the most points efficient shooting that Tyranids can get, so might as well spam it. Uh, followed by two Maliceptors. Uh, these guys are very average at everything, um, but also just very efficient for their points. Their shooting is kind of meh because of AP2. But and their combat is also very AP meh, or very meh with AP 2 strength 9 smash attacks or AP 1 sweep attacks. Uh, it's just, yeah, very meh combat, very meh shooting, but their durability 
is incredible, um, and their aura of minus one to hit can actually really shut down a lot of big combat units. Um, so I basically put the Maliceptors just in the front of my army and say, shoot these, and my opponent is pretty much always more than happy to oblige. I then throw up a five up feel no pain and I just live. And that's that's what the Maliceptors do. They're bullet sponges and charge sponges. Uh, then we get into the three Neurolictors, already talked about those. Two Pyrovores, these are just action monkeys, and if possible, they're great for giving ignore cover, so that way the Maliceptor's gun can actually do something. Um, if the Pyrovore can combo that, then the Maliceptor shooting actually becomes decent. So that's why they're there. Then a Ripper Swarm, just for another secondary piece of trash. Um, and then we get into two Trigons. These guys, um, I played them with my uh, Hero Fint, at the Salt Lake Open, and honestly, they were more MVPs than the Her than the Herofant was. So I decided to give them a second shot and put two Trigons in this list. And yeah, they were absolutely incredible. Um, keep them both in deep strike. And what tended to happen would be I'd rapid ingress one, and then I'd just try for a nine inch charge with the other one. Uh, and most of the time, that would turn into two Trigons that my opponent has to shoot in addition to all the Maliceptors and Exocrines that my opponent also wants to shoot. And it just kind of became a monster threat overload, which normally resulted in at least one of the Trigons connecting with my opponent and at least doing reasonable damage. Um, again, they can combo really well with the Melee Warriors Adrenal Surge strat. So if you've got your lethal hits against vehicles and you happen to have some Warriors within uh, synapse range of that Trigon, you can spend those 2 CP, and the Melee Warriors and the Trigon can get critically hitting on 5s, which makes them considerably better. So yeah, that's the list. Um, honestly, it's really straightforward. There's not really any tricks to it other than the standard Battleshock from Neurolictors and the Warriors being kind of a niche pick that most people are not going with, but honestly, they do a really surprising amount of damage, and I caught a lot of my opponents off guard with just how killy they are. Um, and then give them a 5-up field, no pain, and they actually can survive a decent amount of clap back. But moving on, let's get into my games. So I apologize here, but um, I did not end up taking any pictures of my first game. I guess I was just kind of swept up in the moment of how cool this event was and uh, I'd been, you know, I'd flown in late the night before, so just kind of missed it and that is completely my bad. Um, I got much better as the event progressed on taking more and more pictures for each game. So uh, with this, we're just gonna go over the score. So for the first game, we are playing uh, Take and Hold. So very standard, um, the most standard 40k you can do and yeah my opponent was Kevin and he was playing um, Vanguard Blood Angels so let me see if I can get his list all right so he called his list sneaky sanguineous but yeah it's a Blood Angel Vanguard Spearhead um, his list has a chaplain with jump pack um, He's got a Inferno Pistol and the Blade Driven Deep Enhancement. And this guy basically joins 10 Death Company Marines with Jump Packs, Inferno Pistols, and Power Fists. Uh, absolutely massive beat stick unit that gets to just infiltrate, start in the middle of the board, and obliterate your opponent right from the get-go. Uh, in addition to that, he has Lamartis. Um, so, you know, named Chaplain joining a second unit of 10 Death Company. He gives the unit um, minus one damage, I believe, and just makes them incredibly tanky. And basically, they are round two punch unit. Uh, in addition to that, he has a Lieutenant with Combi Weapon with the Shadow War Veteran Enhancement. I think that just gives him Lone Op. Um, so, yeah, he just gives him an extra Lone Op to do secondaries with. Um, in addition to that, he had two Gladiator Lancers. Obviously, these guys are the massive anti-tank guns with full rerolls, essentially, that Space Marines have. Uh, incredibly good at picking up all of my monsters. 
And then he has two six-man Inceptor squads, one with Bolters, one with uh, Plasma. These guys deep strike in three away, pick up a unit, and are the ultimate glass cannon as well. Uh, infiltrators, single squad of five, then a single squad of five scouts, uh, and then a storm speeder thunderstrike. This guy basically, he shoots, and as long as he hits a monster, he gets to pick it for the rest of his army to get plus one to wound and shooting against. Um, incredibly good. So he combos that with the plasma and the bolter guys, and he can just obliterate uh, one target and finally wrapping up we've got a Kalidus. Uh every Imperium list I feel like includes a Kalidus now if they're being serious about winning so yep we got that in uh, honestly that this is kind of what Space Marines are now is you've got two big melee beat stick units followed by two really big anti-tank units um, and either a 633 or a 66 of Inceptors and then Scouts, Kalidus, and Fluff to kind of fill in the rest of the list. Um, so very strong list. And if my opponent gets to go first, then those Death Company Marines just get to jump on me and obliterate me. Um, however, in this game, uh, I, I ended up going first. And basically, I got really lucky right off the bat, not only going first, but... Uh, he had sufficiently hidden uh, to the point where I wasn't able to get anything except that 10-man Death Company squad that he deployed just behind a wall uh, right off the center objective. I basically moved my one of my squads of warriors to uh, within range of needing a 9-inch charge on that unit just to kind of tell him to back off, um, assuming that he would have to spend the CP to run away because he definitely doesn't want me charging him first. Uh, and then if I do that, then that's essentially the only unit that he will be able to charge in his turn and basically force those Death Company Marines to go into my Warriors, which then I could spend a CP and fight on death and kill a big chunk of them before um, the rest of my army just pick him up. And that's basically what happened. Uh, he did spend the CP. However, he only rolled a 1 and only moved a singular inch away. And then I just casually rolled a 10 on the charge, made it in, and killed eight of the Death Company Marines uh, with the Warriors. Uh, and that was with them unbuffed. <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't have the CP for Adrenal Glands, and I just, yeah, I just casually killed eight Death Company Marines. And on his clapback, he actually did really good. He killed four of the six-man warrior squad with just the uh just the chaplain and two death company guys so that just goes to show how hard this unit really hits uh his three models picked up four of my warriors um yeah and then with that uh that kind of set the tone for that game where As you can see, uh, turn one, I got behind enemy lines because they made that charge, managed to get into my opponent, or no, a spore mine got into the opponent's deployment zone. I was sitting in the middle. Uh, but I did get tempting target. That was super easy because I got to go first and I had lictors that could just walk on and, or the center if he had chosen that. Uh, so yeah, managed to basically kill most of that squad and keep them in combat for the guys that were there. Uh, and then on Kevin's turn, as you can see, uh, he pulled Capture Enemy Outpost and Assassinate. So Capture Enemy Outpost turn one is always uh, kind of sucks to get, but uh, Assassinate he absolutely could do because my Winged Tyranid Prime was sitting there right in front of his entire army, uh, just in combat with the Chaplain and two Death Company. Uh, however, Kevin decided to not expose any of his stuff and continue to hide from my entire gun line. And he figured the chaplain and two death company, considering they killed four warriors previously, would be able to finish off my um, winged prime themselves. And he was barely incorrect. Uh, I used the CP for the five up feel no pain. Uh, I got to fight first, of course, and I killed one of the death company. So he had a singular death company and uh, the chaplain attacking me and he killed both warriors and put my winged prime down to a singular wound 
just barely missing out on assassinate. Um, so he elected to hold on to it, uh, as well as capture enemy outposts because he did have a ton of inceptors that could cut show up three away and, um, you know, potentially flip that objective if I was lazy about it. Um, but with that, he kind of just took a completely passive turn one. And so then that made it where it was my turn two, uh, and I scored a massive 15 primary because he was so passive and I just got to hold all of the center objectives with lictors, uh, as well as my home. So 15 primary there. Um, and I pulled Defend Stronghold and Assassinate. And conveniently enough, I had a chaplain with a lone death company just sitting out in the middle of the board. So I managed to kill him. Um, I believe my, yeah, my um, one wound prime passed his Battleshock check, fell back uh, behind a wall, and allowed an Exocrine to just shoot and kill the chaplain and death company marine for my assassinate points. And I just kind of held position and passed the turn, uh, giving Kevin a five for holding his home objective. Um, but I did, you know, move my guys around to make sure there was no way he was going to get my capture enemy outpost. Um, and then on his turn, he basically came in with all of his reserves, killed a bunch of stuff, including my one wound prime. He brought out his other death guard unit with Lamartis our death company unit with Marty's and managed to kill off uh, my prime as well as death leaper, I think, but uh, didn't really matter. Uh, his shooting, honestly, sorry guys, this is why I needed pictures. I don't remember much from this point, but he, he brought out his second unit of guys and I rapid ingressed my warriors out of my second unit of warriors uh, from outflank into a position where they couldn't get shot. And his shooting did pretty good. I think he killed two of my exocrines. Um, but then in my turn, my Maliceptor decided to be a boss and somehow one Maliceptor picked up six Inceptors by himself in shooting. And then he charged the land speeder. He needed an 11 and he got it. And then his three smash attacks got two hits, two wounds, no saves. And I rolled a like, 14 for damage with my 2d6 plus 2 or no i rolled an 11 but it was enough i think that it only has like nine wounds but yeah the one maliceptor decided to just go absolute crazy mode killed all six inceptors with shooting and picked up the, the speeder in combat um and yeah that's just kind of how this game went my warriors that i rapid ingressed in uh went and killed off his second death company unit and with that, his Lancers managed to pick up a guy a turn, but eventually it just didn't really matter anymore. Um, and yeah, he just lost all of his trade pieces, so he wasn't really able to score. And I basically held the center of the table with just lick my Neurolictors um, and killed all of his stuff that was able to kill me other than his Lancers. And yeah, as you can see, massive win for me, 95 to 53. Um, could have been an incredibly different game if he'd gone first or if I hadn't made that initial nine inch charge that just kind of started it. But the dice were certainly in my favor this game by a lot. So moving on to game two, uh, I do have pictures for this game as well as the rest of them. Uh, let me know if this is a format that works for you guys where I have the pictures next to the score so you guys can happily follow along but round two i got paired against none other than nick nanabadi mr brown magic himself um this is great i've actually never played nick before um, i've played pretty much the rest of the art of war team and now that i've played nick i will have played everyone except for quentin um so very excited that i got to play him i wish it wasn't in round two when the standings are win path but <laughs> Uh, you know, you get what you get. So Nick is playing uh, Chaos Space Marines, and he titled his list Good Shit, because, yep, he just brought all the good shit that Chaos Space Marines can bring. Uh, that being three Chaos Lords, all undivided, and imagine that they're attached to three giant squads of Chosen. Uh, and by giant, I just mean 5 5 10. Uh, all going inside of Nurgle Rhinos, imagine that, so the Rhinos can get to um, 
carry the Chosen where they need to go and pop the Nurgle strat so they can't be shot. And then the Undivided guys get out and the Chaos Lord gets to use a strat for free and that strat just happens to be full rerolls for Undivided units so they get full rerolls to hit and wound. And these units just hit like an absolute ton of bricks. Uh, very strong, very popular in the meta right now. Um, but in addition to that, uh, Nick also brought along Cypher. So he's just a lone op that can advance and do actions and isn't bad in shooting or combat if you happen to get too close to him. Uh, he also brought a 10-man cultist squad with Nurgle, so that way they can just sit on his backfield objective and remain unmolested over the course of the entire game. Uh, other than that, in addition to these uh, Nurgle, Rhinos, and Chosen, uh, he also has two Forge Fiends, one undivided, one with Nurgle. So the Nurgle one starts on the table and can pop the Nurgle strat if I feel like shooting it. And the other one uh, that is undivided goes into reserve, comes on the edge of the board, pops full rerolls, and shoots me with full rerolls to hit and wound and picks up pretty much anything it wants to shoot at. Uh, and then to finish off the list, we've got an allied detachment of two times three Nurglings. These guys are just great at screening um, out infiltrators and just doing random secondaries. Um, and then finally, the real uh, anvil or hammer, however you want to look at it. Uh, three units of two obliterators, one undivided, one Nurgle, one Zinch. And these guys just all go in deep strike, come down and pick up whatever they want with their ignore line of sight ability um, if they need it or hold on to it if they don't. And yeah, this <laughs> Nick calling it good shit is absolutely appropriate because that's what it is. This is very much the meta pick for CSM these days. All right, so getting into it, now that we finally have pictures, I can kind of explain. Uh, we played Scorched Earth, Dawn of War. Um, so Scorched, Scorched Earth is, uh, you get five points per primary you hold at the beginning of your turn up to 10, and then you get additional points for primary depending on how many objectives you burn, um, which is just do an action on an objective in your shooting phase. And as long as the unit is still there, you still control the objective. Um, in your next command phase, you pick the objective up and you get... Uh, five points for doing it on a no man's land and 10 points for doing it on your opponent's home objective at the end of the game. Uh, Nick went ahead and decided to go for fixed with bring it down and deploy teleport homers. Um, I do have 21 points of bring it down and I elected to go for tactical as I do want the extra CP that I could get for pitching objectives. Um, and yeah, now you guys can see what kind of terrain we get. So Cali Cup was doing a really cool mixed format between player placed and um, pre-setup. And basically what the pre-setup is, is those two small L um, ruins uh, around the center objective are preset, and then the rest of the pieces are player placed. So with that, um, it kind of removes the advantage of placing the first piece of terrain and um, yeah, you just always guarantee that the center objective is at least going to have a little bit of cover and you can block firing lanes across the center of the table. Um, so what you see here is the end of my turn one. Uh, Nick got to go first and basically his turn was he moved his Forge Fiend out, shot at my Exocrine, and I think did like seven wounds to it. Um, not a lot, not enough to degrade it, not enough to even make me take Battle Shock. So um, he didn't do a ton. And then on my turn, uh, and other than that, he just moved his rhinos up to basically take board control, uh, keeping the chosen inside. And so then on my turn, um, oh, and he had some nerglings uh, in, right off of that center objective, just barely within six to do teleport homers. So he got teleport homers on the center. Uh, and then on my turn, I pulled overwhelming force. There was nothing on objectives for me to kill. Um, and I pulled Tempting Target, which he elected to be the right objective, which uh, I didn't have anything really in range of getting to. As you can see, my Maliceptor tried, uh, but yeah, wasn't really going to get there. Um, so 
basically what I did is I lined everyone up where they could shoot at at least two things, uh, the Forge Fiend and a Rhino. And then Nick Nurgle stratted the Forge Fiend as I knew he would, um, as it's the only smart thing to do. So then I basically got to fire all of my guys at whatever Rhino they happened to be able to see. And as you can see, I did a bunch of chip damage to a bunch of Rhinos, but I didn't actually kill anything. Um, the closest I got was the Rhino on the right side. I got down to four wounds. Um, but yeah, really subtle turn one. Nobody actually killed anything. Um, but then came Nick's turn two. Uh, this... So turn two is where Nick brought in all of his reserves. Uh, I basically had moved forward and said, uh, there's nothing I can really do against you in terms of like trying to outmaneuver you because you get to deep strike down and just shoot me from out of line of sight with your obliterators. So I'm not even going to try and hide. I'm just going to basically take it on the chin and be in a position to punch you back with whatever survives. Um, Nick said, okay, <laughs> uh, which is absolutely the right play by Nick as CSM have the hardest levels of shooting uh, or, you know, the most lethal firepower in the entire game. Uh, so telling him to hit me with everything he's got, of course, he's going to say yes to that. And um, I just didn't really have another option. There was no way I was going to be able to hide from him. So Here's where you see Nick coming down. So his uh, Nurgle Forge Fiend moved off to the left to get a good angle on my two Exocrines uh, down by my center home objective. His other uh, Forge Fiend outflanked into his deployment zone with the Undivided, which you see up in the top right corner here. Uh, and then all six of his Obliterators deep struck down um, in a position to get uh, one of them within Melter range. Uh, of each of my monsters and then he uh, got out all of his chosen ready to charge whatever survived this massive storm of firepower and uh, yeah he managed to pick up a ton um, although I knew he would uh, I looked at a spot to rapid ingress in one of my trigons and really they're just I really wanted to deep strike one right next to that undivided forge fiend but and tell him you have to shoot this. Um, however, that's the the reality is he absolutely would do that. And even if he didn't, um, the Trigon being unsupported by warriors would not be able to kill the Forge Fiend in return. Uh, even with lethal hits, he would have to get the sustained fives to be able to actually pick it up. Um, and I just couldn't afford to do that with also 20 chosen breathing down my deployment zone. So I put him in my deployment zone and just gave him another thing to have to shoot uh, in a position to basically counter punch chosen, which he is much better at killing. But as you can see uh, by Nick's bring it down, he did manage to pick up three monsters on that turn. So he did kill two exocrines and a Maliceptor um, in his turn with all of his shooting. And I believe he picked up a couple warriors maybe not um, I'm trying to remember but uh, he definitely killed the two exocrines and the maliceptor uh, which was actually not as bad as I thought it would take and in my turn I went to clean up all of the chosen um, managed to get my overwhelming force by killing uh, the chosen and a lord off of the center objective that was his 10-man chosen squad was there and my warriors managed to pick up all 10 of them plus their lord to get a five on overwhelming force. Um, and conveniently, I had drawn extend battle lines, which is super easy to do. Um, hence, where my warriors went straight for the middle objective. Um, in addition to that, my Trigon on the right actually popped off and picked up five chosen and a lord by himself and also flipping that objective. Um, on the left flank, I was a little less lucky um, between the Exocrine, Maliceptor, and a long 9-inch charge from a Trigon trying to charge over a Pyrovore, um, which obviously I didn't make. But between the Maliceptor and Exocrine, I killed the five Chosen, um, but I did not kill the Lord. So, um, But I did kill all 20 of his Chosen in that turn. Unfortunately, I 
didn't have anything left to kill anything else. So all six of his obliterators and both Forge Fiends are still alive, but I have removed his melee threat. Um, so now I just have to survive through one more turn of shooting, and then I can really um, start to chip away at his army. Um, unfortunately, surviving against uh, six obliterators shooting is pretty difficult, as well as double Forge Fiend. Um, so he did manage to kill another Exocrine, um, in that turn, and then he killed a Trigon the turn after that. So turn three and four, picked up a monster on each turn. Um, what you are seeing here is kind of the end of turn four. Um, sorry, I didn't really take a good picture of turn three, but basically what happened is his obliterators picked up all of my warriors in the center, um, and he killed a Exocrine. And then my Trigon kind of popped off and killed a Rhino on the right side. Um, before his and my um, Maliceptor and Trigon killed his Nurgle Forge Fiend on the left side. Uh, but then Nick's turn four was killing the Trigon on the right with his remaining four Obliterators. Um, hilariously enough, after the Forge Fiend and four Obliterators shot at the Trigon, it actually was alive with two wounds left. So he had to charge his uh, undivided uh obliterators in to do the last two wounds he did but i fought on death managed to roll the four and the trigon picked up both of those obliterators as well um so trigon was just really kicking ass over there um and meanwhile on the other side the maliceptor and trigon picked up a forge fiend and then what happened after that was nick basically just tied up all of my stuff with his remaining rhinos and unfortunately the rhino that you now see on my home objective is obviously out OCing my lone biovore and is begun to torch my home objective, <laughs> uh, which really sucks. And um, unfortunately, I'm if you're looking at the score, I am definitely not scoring my secondaries or primaries. Nick unfortunately just had total board control over the course of this. Um, I am killing his stuff actually way better than I thought I would. Um, and I'm even surviving a little better than I thought I would, but I am not scoring in the process. So yeah, um, this is end of turn four. This might even actually be the end of Nick's turn, or no. So yeah, this is the end of turn four because then Nick's turn five turned into that Rhino finished torching my home objective, giving Nick a max 50 on primary. Um, and then basically my turn five was, and, and he, uh, he had his undivided Forge Fiend, and there are two Obliterators on the center objective underneath that ruin. You just can't see them. Uh, but those two Obliterators and the Forge Fiend on the right shot at my Trigon, put it down to like four wounds left, but he lived. Uh, and then basically my turn five, that Trigon, I pulled Area Denial um, and Secure No Man's Land. And basically that Trigon managed to go all the way over to charge those two obliterators he made the 10 inch charge killed both of them giving me area denial and full secure no man's land uh, i guess i didn't give myself full points but we did in the actual submit scoring um but nick had obviously won the game but yeah it uh it went better than i thought it would honestly especially against someone of nick's caliber playing what is arguably the best army in the game, if not top two. Them and Eldar, obviously, are head and shoulders above the rest. Um, so yeah, I'm happy with my showing. Uh, Points-wise, obviously, I would have liked to have more points, but as far as control of the battlefield and the, how much we punched each other, I think I actually did pretty decent, especially with him going first in Dawn of War and just being able to get full table control. But yeah, that was the end of round two, where I am now one and one, and unfortunately that kind of knocks me completely out of contention for making it to final cut, even if I were to go five and one. Because it's win path and I lost in round two, um, I'm basically out for the tournament, but I can still perform really well and fight for best Tyranid. Um, just sucks that I got someone of Nick's caliber on round two. Uh, so then immediately after losing to Nick's Chaos Space Marines, my round three, I get paired once again into Chaos Space Marines. Um, my opponent is Christian Blaze, or Chris. Um, incredibly enough, he flew all the way from Quebec, so very happy that he made that journey out. Was a 
phenomenal guy. His army is absolutely incredible. Uh, I highly advise you guys zoom in on some of these pictures because his models were gorgeous. Um, and his list is really fun. Um, he titled it, They Will Not Die, because he brought, of all things, a, uh, where is it? What is it called? Why is it not showing up in his list? There it is, Noctolith Crown. So this is a 125 point fortification that he gave the Mark of Nurgle so he could Nurgle strat his fortification, which is honestly hilarious. But the Noctolith Crown is a 125 point fortification that has a nine inch aura of a four plus and vulnerable save. So that's what you see here in this picture. Um, is him deploying his entire army in this nice white cutout that he brought along to go with the Noctilith crown. And as long as he's in that cutout, he has a four plus invuln. Uh, really good. And I kind of made me laugh and realize like, why don't we see more of this? But the answer is probably just because Nurgle is a thing and why have a four up invuln when you could just spend a CP and not be shot. But um, anyways, Getting into Chris's list, uh, so he was running a dark commune attached to a giant 20-man uh, accursed cultist squad. So that was absolutely gross and fits with the theme of they will not die. Um, and then after that, he had two masters of possession, which were both joined to a five-man possessed squad that were Chaos Undivided. So these are basically replacements for the Chosen. Um, instead, you get Possessed with Master of Possession, and the Master of Possession can basically, uh, he can shank and do a mortal wound to one of the Possessed, and then he gets plus one to hit and wound with his weapons. And in addition, he has all of his weapons are um, anti-psyker two plus, and when you combine that with the possessed, who their thing is your unit gets devastating wounds, um, suddenly these Master of Possession have anti psyker 2 plus dev wounds, and they just do tons of mortals to psychers, and it's really, really gross. Um, then finally, he has a Warpsmith who hangs out in the back with his um, vehicles, which are double Forge Fiend, once again, one Nurgle, one Undivided. Uh, however, this time they are joined by a Hellbrute. Um, the Hellbrute makes it where when they do their Dark Pact, they will crit on fives and they get both uh, lethal and sustained. So that's really good in a six inch aura. So that's what the Hellbrute is doing. And then in addition to that, he had a unit of four Obliterators. Um, these guys were all Zinch. So they basically just hang out in the Noctolith Crown uh, area rely on that four up invuln and then they have a uh, one cp strat to bring a guy back and heal three wounds to an existing wounded guy so that's just again they will not die uh and then finally rounding out the list he has a single unit of five raptors and a single unit of five warp talons these are all just jump pack guys that are really good at doing secondaries um and the warp talons have mark of slanesh so they can get advance and charge and just do tons and tons of sustained attacks so moving on to the actual game itself, um, we were playing Take and Hold. So the exact same as Mission 1, except a uh, different deployment type. Um, but yeah, you just the special mission here, though, was Sticky Objectives, uh, which actually really did come into play this game. And in this game, I did manage to get first turn. But as you can see, he just deployed everything inside the, re the region of the Noctilith Crown. And I kind of deployed relatively close to on the line. I hid my exocrines and I basically gave him angles on my maliceptors for him in case he went first. Um, I have my warriors are hidden and my other warrior squad is an outflank alongside my two trigons and a pyrovore, which is kind of the same setup that I did almost every single game this weekend. Um, one warrior squad and outflank and one pyrovore and outflank alongside the trigons. Um, yeah, so I got first turn and I pulled Bring It Down and Area Denial. Again, Area Denial is super easy. Um, I just moved my Neurolictor onto the center of the table and because he hadn't gone yet, there was nothing there. 
Um, bring it down. I because he only had two Forge Fiends and a Hellbrute. I made a very interesting choice this game and decided to go for sustained hits against infantry. Normally, I think with Tyranids, uh, you just kind of want to go lethal hits against vehicles all the time because that's the only way you're killing vehicles. But I went for a gamble and said, I can't kill them anyways, so I'm not even going to try. I will just kill everything else. <laughs> um, was definitely a gamble. But uh, yeah, I got Bring It Down and Area Denial. Area Denial, like I said, was really easy. And then what ended up happening was I moved my entire army in such a way to get line of sight on his four obliterators and i fired three exocrines and two maliceptors all at the two obliterators he did pop the nurgle strat on them um however because they're zinch it didn't make it where i couldn't shoot them it made it where they were just stealth so minus one to hit so all of my guys were hitting them on fours however i did have exploding sixes and as soon as i fired that first exocrine the rest of them got reroll ones to hit Again, here's just a nice close-up of his army. Absolutely gorgeous models. Uh, all the little gun firing effects, very cool. Uh, but yeah, so my turn one, I basically moved, as you can now see, kind of where my Exocrines and Maliceptors are lined up. They all got a line on his Obliterators and it literally came down to the very last guy, uh, very last Maliceptor getting one wound on one guy who had two wounds left four up invuln, failed it, picked up the last obliterator. And that was absolutely huge because if he had made that save, he then could have spent the CP, healed that obliterator, brought another one back. Um, and he still would have had half his unit being able to shoot me. Uh, and if I didn't kill it on the next turn, he could have just potentially by the end of the game, that unit could have been back to full strength. So was absolutely clutch that he did fail that very last save, um, killing that obliterator. And yeah, I very much exposed myself in order to do so, um, but I think it was worth it. Killing off all four obliterators before they got to shoot me was big. Um, then we went into Chris's turn one where his possessed basically came forward and went after both of my maliceptors um, because again, maliceptors are psychers and they have master of possessions with anti-psyker two plus dev wounds. So that hurt a lot. Um, what you can also see is his 20 man accursed cultist brick basically moving up to take the center objective and surround my neurolictor. Now, what is also interesting that you see in this picture is in that top left objective, uh, I moved a singular neurolictor there um, onto the objective, just barely toe in to be as far away as possible from getting shot. Um, and Chris here does not move anything towards that objective. Um, in the bottom right, I don't remember what was there, but I believe he brought in his uh, warp talons and they just grabbed the objective essentially down in that bottom right corner. Uh, this is just a really funny picture of my Neurolictor being completely surrounded by 20 accursed cultists and a unit of possessed. <laughs> uh, he's all alone in the center, but that's all right. We're going to send him some help. But yeah, uh, Chris ended up pulling extend battle lines and no prisoners for turn one. Very easy for him to do, extend battle lines. He just needed to move his accursed cultist squad onto the center objective, which he did. And no prisoners, he needed to kill three units, which he did. He killed off um, both Maliceptors and I, he didn't kill the Neurolictor, which was completely surrounded. I, I know that. Um, I don't remember what else he killed. Oh, and a exocrine with his forge fiend shooting. So he killed off a exocrine and both maliceptors to get three monster kills in turn one, which is actually really big. So yeah, you can see here now um, the possessed killed off both of my maliceptors and his shooting killed off one of the exocrines. Uh, and basically then in my turn, uh, I had a really, really bad turn two where I had both of my exocrines lined up to shoot into his possessed and they didn't even have to move and they kind of have pro perfect profiles for killing possessed. But turns out when they have a five up invuln and a six up feel no pain, they just get to be way more durable than they should be. Um, so yeah, I killed one possessed with both exocrines and that is not what I needed my turn two to be. But thankfully uh, my turn three turned it around.
Yeah, so my turn three, uh, my warriors came in from the outflank um, and picked up a unit of possessed, and my other warriors managed to, or no, my Trigon and Death Leaper managed to kill off his other unit of possessed on my turn three, as well as my Trigon managed to deep strike on his home objective and shoot off just enough uh, cultists off of it that I stole it from him. Um, and I think this was a critical turning point in the game because as you are looking, um, my warriors in the bottom right, sorry, they didn't kill Possessed. They killed off his uh, Warp Talons down there. And then actually, and the Warp Talons were in such a position that both of his Forge Fiends could have shot my warriors. And that's when I remembered that Invasion Fleet has overrun. I spent my CP and overrun back behind the wall. Um to keep that warrior squad safe. And that was absolutely huge, um, being able to do that. And yeah, this is the current look before his turn, Chris's turn four. Um, and yeah, now you can see, uh, he decided to turn his forge fiends around to go back home, take his home objective and kill off the Trigon that was there, which while not necessarily a mistake, um, allowed me to then take my turn four to completely obliterate his accursed cultist squad and retake the center. And that ended up being kind of the final blow of the game um, to then allow my turn five to get a massive 15 on primary because uh, keep in mind this entire time that top left objective that I had a singular Neurolictor on, he just decided to walk off and the objective was stickied for the entire game. So I had my home and the top left and occasionally the bottom right um, or the center. And so I managed to massively win that primary game uh, because of that. But yeah, it, it took a Trigon and an entire six man warrior squad. And I popped that Adrenal Surge strat to critically hit on fives with both of them uh, to get all those sustained hits. And I killed off, uh, I didn't kill all 20 of them, but I killed off the squad so it was just the character that was left which meant he couldn't bring back guys anymore and that gave me the center objective and basically the win of the game so yeah then that allowed me to wrap up day one being two and one um with my only loss being versus nick nanavati i certainly cannot be upset with that so moving on to day two um, I get to play against uh, Tony, uh, Antonio Biello, but Tony. Uh, he is a member of the Xenos Petting Zoo, and he plays Orcs. Um, very thankful I'm not fighting Power Armor <laughs> for a fourth game in a row. So I finally get to fight Orcs, and my leadership shenanigans finally get to come into play uh, because, you know, they're, they're not leadership six in their entire army. Um, so... Tony's list, uh, with orcs, he's got a beast boss, um, which is attached to six of the uh, squig hog boys. And then he has Captain Badruck attached to his 10, uh, what are they? Not storm boys, they are flash kits. Uh, and those are all in a truck. Then he has Mazrog, doing his Mazrog thing, followed by a knob on Smash a Squig with the um, enhancement for the also four up, or for, no, super killy knob on Smash a Squig. And that was what was attached to the um, Squig Hog Boys. And then, yeah, sorry, he just has a Beast Boss, which goes with the Beast Snagga Boys, also in a truck, and two War Boss, also with um, in trucks with just knobs yeah 10 knobs so two trucks full of 10 knobs and war boss one truck full of beast snagga boys and a beast boss and a final truck full of uh bad truck and 10 flash gets and then yeah uh mazrog and three war bikers and finally knob on smash a squig with six squig hog boys um very powerful punchy list and lots of transports that you have to get through um really good orc list so we were playing um vital ground which is remove the center objective and we were playing hammer and anvil which for the first time ever 
it was advantageous for me to play on hammer and anvil because I was the shooting army in this matchup. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then on top of that, Tony won first turn, which was very beneficial for me because um, I was pretty much for all intents and purposes out of charge range. The only thing, if he really wanted to go for it, he could have tried a charge against Maliceptors or a Neurolictor, um, either of which I'd be totally fine with him attempting to charge. Um, but he pulled area denial and investigate signals. Um, and what that allowed him to do was he basically sent a truck back with knobs into the corner to get um, investigate signals, as well as his war bikers went and got the other investigate signals. Um, however, for area denial, he was kind of torn about wanting to do it or not, uh, but he finally elected to go for it and threw all of his squig hog boys uh, just up into the center to basically grab area denial. Um, and he fully planned on basically giving them their like T7, so he wanted to give them the minus one to wound strat and hopefully withstand the majority of my shooting. Unfortunately for him, um, he failed his leadership check off of the Neurolictor, which meant he couldn't use the strat. And instead of being minus one to wound, I got plus one to wound. <laughs> and my Exocrine's Maliceptor Death Leaper uh, managed to pick up the entire squad, including the character. Um, and actually Death Leaper even got the final kill on the character to gain me an extra CP. Meanwhile, on the top end of the board, um, he had gotten out his flash gits to shoot at an Exocrine. And I think he really really whiffed especially because the exocrine was in cover um so he did like six damage to it <laughs> it was it was really bad for Mazarog and his boys or uh for badrock and his boys and basically my exocrines and maliceptor all got to shoot back at them and picked up most of them and then my warriors uh tried to finish off the last few of them managed to make their 10 inch charge killed off the remainder of the uh, flash gets and put Badruk down to a singular wound. Um, I honestly should have killed him too, but I can't complain because I got really lucky with that 10 inch charge. So he managed to live with a singular wound and basically he ran away into the truck um, and basically got to shoot for most of the rest of the game just out of that truck. But <laughs> um, it's fine. I'd killed all of his friends. So... Um, in addition to that, basically being able to move a Neurolictor to take the bottom objective and my Warriors taking the top objective and Death Leaper and a Maliceptor removing all of the Squig Hog boys from the center. And that was my turn one. Um, really set the tone for this game uh, where he basically got uh, only two points for holding his home objective on primary. And then he pulled Tempting Target and Overwhelming Force. Um, I tempted him with the bottom objective, telling him he needs to come get it. And what you see in this picture is him measuring out if his truck could just go and outsee my Neurolictor, and it could. So he got his Tempting Target. And um, Overwhelming Force, all he did was in the top objective, he got out his Beast Snaga boys from a truck, charged into my Warriors killed them and the prime which is two units on an objective which he managed to kill so he maxed out overwhelming force um and then we get to my clapback with turn my turn two um in my turn two i pulled extend battle lines and storm hostile so all i had to do was take the objective back from his one truck that was out OCing me by one um, and that actually was really easy to do because the truck failed battle shock. And so I actually just got it automatically. Um, importantly, it is take an objective that your opponent held at the start of the turn. Uh, the truck did hold it at the start of the turn. And then in my command phase is when I made him fail battle shock and he became OC zero. So we actually had to call a judge for that one because we didn't have the cards, um, but we got it clarified. And yes, as long as he controlled it at the start of the turn, then I get the points. Um, so I got that just kind of automatically there. And yeah, I didn't want to commit too far forward because that ruin um, just to the left of the bottom objective has 20 knobs in it. <laughs> so um, I really didn't want to mess with that or at least commit too much to get charged by that. So it was just a Neurolictor and a Pyrobore um, against that Battleshocked truck. Uh, so that way on his turn when he unbattleshocks, it's at least a contested objective and he doesn't get it. 
Uh, meanwhile, my uh, the rest of my army managed to kill... I forgot what he threw in the center, but I it might have been a unit of knobs. Um, something was in the center, and my warriors went in and obliterated it. And uh, I kind of left the top objective to him, but what was really important this turn was Mazrog was pretty much right up in my lines. And once again, he failed Battleshock, so he couldn't be minus one to wound, and all of my Exocrines were suddenly wounding him on fours instead of sixes, and that made a massive difference. So I actually killed Mazrog in one turn just by shooting him with all three Exocrines and a Maliceptor. Um, yeah, that was really good turn for me. Then we get to Tony's turn three. Um, he does hold the top objective, so he managed to get seven points there. Um, and he does bring out all of the knobs to come and obliterate the bottom objective. So, um, however, like I said, I didn't throw a lot of stuff down there. And then I also declared Shadow in the Warp, so those knobs that came out were battle shocked because they failed. Uh, if you're hearing a theme here, this is the game where I got every single battle shock I wanted, and it was incredible for me, not for Tony. Um, and I rapid ingress to Trigon right in his lines uh, in the area where his knobs had just left. So that was kind of annoying for him that he now has a Trigon in his lines and his choices are turn around and go and deal with it or just let it rampage through his grots in the backfield. And he elected for the latter. Uh, and then in my turn three, I actually controlled both objectives because he was battle shocked from Shadow and the Warp. Uh, so I got a big 12 on primary. Um, I pulled Investigate Signals, which normally I'm really good at, but I honestly just forgot because of all of the maelstrom of stuff that I was killing. So, oh darn, poor me. But uh, yeah, and then I got um, Behind Enemy Lines, which I just had the singular Trigon there for. Um, unfortunately, no one else could quite reach it. But as you can see by the table, uh, Tony is very quickly running out of stuff because I was able to absolutely obliterate his battle shocked knobs because once again, I was plus one to wound and my warriors in the center managed to go up to the um, top and kill off all of his beast snaga boys. Uh, hilariously, he elected to have the Gretchen tie up the Trigon rather than allow it to go and actually take his home field. And it worked, they tied him up. It took him two full turns to kill off the 10 Gretchen. So, <laughs> uh, good for them. But at that point, the game ended with a pretty resound uh, tabling, and yeah, we wrapped it up there with a pretty big win there uh, for the Tyranids. All right, and so then we go on to round five. I am three and one, and uh, my luck of playing Xenos where I get to Battleshock them is over. It's back to Power Armor. So I am playing TJ. Um, he is playing the new um, Space Marines Iron Storm Spearhead, and he is playing them as Black Templars, so every vehicle gets an extra multi melta for five points, because that's fun. Um, TJ, phenomenal player, phenomenal opponent. Um, and his list is kind of the standard uh, Iron Storm that I think you'll be seeing. If it's not Dreadnoughts, it will be this. Uh, but he's got his two tech marines, one with Master of Machine War, which is a aura of uh, lethal hits in a six inch aura. And then his second tech marine has the target augury web, which is another aura that allows you to fall back and shoot and advance and shoot with any vehicle that's within six inches. Um, these guys, they're just crazy. So he just castles with all of his grav tanks and he gets lethal hits and fall back and shoot, advance and shoot. Um, yeah, really good. And then in addition to that, he has a whopping five five-man Crusader squads, every single one with a um, Laz Cannon Melta gun. So that's really cool because uh, a 65-point unit is five Space Marine bodies with a Grav Pistol, um, two Power Fists, a Laz Cannon, and a Melta gun. Really good for 65 points. And so he's brought five of those. Uh, he also has a Ballistus Dreadnought, in addition to two more uh, Lancers, two Reapers, um, so those are the anti-infantry versions of the Gladiators, and a Invictor Tactical Warsuit, 
in addition to two scout squads um, and a storm speeder thunderstrike that's the same one as round one where if it shoots at a monster he gets plus one to wound against it as long as he hits uh, and then he brought in as allied units a armager warglaive and a Calidus and Codiez. So, yeah. Um, and of course, we're playing on the mission where uh, at the beginning of your turn, if you control your home field, you get a CP on a four up. And Codiez's ability is if your opponent gets a CP outside of their normal one, then on a two up, you get a CP. And then he had a Calidus to Vect me. So, he has absolute control over um, command points this game. And um, in addition to speed and firepower with being able to advance, fall back, and shoot with all of his tanks, and of course their tanks, which Tyranids really struggle to kill. Um, but we're going to give it a shot. So we are playing Supply Drop, which is the one where the primary objectives disappear. You do not get any points for holding your home objective. And uh, so... We ended up rolling it out, and the top left objective was the first one to disappear, which was good for me, because that's my opponent's objective. The second one to disappear was the bottom right, which is bad for me, because that was my objective. And so we were fighting over the center, which was possible, um, and it kind of depended on if I got bottom of turn. And I did get bottom of turn, which normally I would be really happy about, except if you look at this table, um, it was really light on line of sight blocking terrain. So I was given one L and then two what I have dubbed pieces of toast to hide behind, which are great to hide behind a for a singular angle. Um, but if your opponent has the speed to get around that angle, then they can shoot you. And that is exactly what happened in this game. Uh, TJ got to go first. We are playing um, basically the diagonal Dawn of War. And he had uh, more drops than me. So he basically just waited me out because of his five Crusader squads. He had more drops than me. And uh, he waited me out. And as soon as I finished deploying everything, he then dropped all of his tanks in the top right corner, top left corner, uh, then got first turn. And because of his tech Marines being able to allow all of those tanks to advance and shoot, and they have a 10 inch move base, uh, yeah, he was able to basically get a line on my entire army right at the top of turn one. And uh, here, let's see how that went for the Tyranids. Oh, wow. Look at that. Tyranids don't have an army anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, really incredibly brutal alpha strike. And unfortunately, the terrain just didn't even give me a chance. Uh, and... The dice also started off, I, I'd been having a really good luck uh, with dice throughout the entire tournament so far, so my time has come. And the very first shot of the game was a Gladiator Lancer shot my Maliceptor, two hits, two wounds, two failed invuln saves. He rolls exactly 14 damage to kill it, and it explodes, hitting every single unit in my army, or like eight units in my army. Um, and that just... Yep, same thing. Set the tone for the game right there. Uh, his turn one, he managed to kill two Exocrines and a Maliceptor and an entire unit of Warriors plus a character and a Neurolictor. Um, yeah, all of that turn one. Um, and then my turn one, I didn't really get to do anything. I got to, I fired my Exocrine at his land speeder because I pulled Bring It Down. And that was the easiest thing for me to kill. And um, yeah, I did three damage and he rolled three sixes. Or th I did three wounds and he rolled three sixes. So I did zero damage. And like I said, that was turn one and that just set the tone for the game. Um, I did really try. I, I'm talking like the game is already over turn one and it was. But, you know, I, we're, we're here to play Warhammer. So um, I basically went as hard as I could for points and tried shooting at his stuff. I unfortunately didn't kill any vehicles, I don't think. I killed a lot of Crusader squads, but you know, those are all only 65 points. <laughs> so yeah, um, I basically just kind of went for points and I did have bottom of turn. So I basically fortified everything on the bottom right objective, which again was mine. 
and uh, essentially said, I'm going to hold this to score primary as much as I can, and maybe my Biovor can keep me in the secondary game. Uh, and then bottom of five, I'll swing over to grab that uh, center objective for 15 points. And that's what I did. I basically just kind of castled. Um, unfortunately, that gave him control of the entire board for the rest of the game to score all of his points, uh, including Teleport Homer. He just had his Kalidus in my corner for the entire game, and I just didn't have anything to deal with it. So he got all of that. And for Bring It Down, um, by, turn, by the end of turn five, he had killed all of my monsters. Um, and basically, the only thing I had left was my Warrior Squad, which... I desperately wanted to bring out earlier, but I was keeping basically the long game, just just points in mind. Um, so the warriors essentially ran out into the center, killed the one tank that I killed over the course of the entire game to grab uh, the center objective, get me my 15 primary. And uh, on top of that, I pulled area denial, which was pretty cool. Um, and my biovore was actually still alive, so I managed to get a teleport homer in my opponent's deployment zone as well but yeah uh a very thorough beating by tj um and i, I think i could have done a lot better with better terrain but the reality is also tyranids just can't kill uh the iron storm is such a bad detachment for us to go up against so and i think that's just a unfortunate reality of tyranids so then that brings us into round six. I am now three and two and guaranteed out of the top eight. Um, there was like the smallest sliver of chances that I could have gotten into the top eight um, if I won every single game after Nick. But again, even then, probably not because it was win path. Um, so I'm now solidly out of top eight for sure. And the only thing I have to compete for is best Tyranids. And uh, I am tied with Kenneth O'Neillbor, who is the Xenos Petting Zoo Tyranid player, incredible Tyranid player. Uh, and him and I were actually playing on tables next to each other, and both of us got soundly slaughtered. Uh, and we had the exact same win path. We'd both lost round two, we both lost round four, and, uh, or sorry, both lost round two and both lost round five. And Kenneth had just lost to what is my now round six opponent that I got paired up into. Uh, playing Tau. So this is Tim uh, with his, sorry, uh, Tim Gordnicki. Sorry, I butchered that last name. But uh, really cool Tau army that had just beat Kenneth's army, and Kenneth's army was practically identical to mine. He only had one Trigon instead of two, um, and he had, I think, Old One Eye and a Carnifex instead of my warrior bricks and you know he had a hive tyrant because that's probably smart in an invasions fleet with feel no pain but i explained my reasons for not bringing a hive tyrant um so yeah basically we both had triple exocrine double maliceptor with deathly burn three neurolictors and a trigon and then basically just slight variations from there um but yeah, as opposed to Tim running Tau, so I do get to fight another Xenos army, thankfully one that is mostly leadership seven, so I have a chance to battle shock again. Um, but Tim's Tau army is led by Commander Farsight with a second commander in Cold Star Battlesuit, um, having the exemplar of the Kion enhancement, so you know, they get to Kion on turn two. He has a single unit of 10 breachers in a devilfish, uh, two broadsides, and then a massive six-man cyclic ion blaster uh, crisis battlesuit squad with like 10 shield drones, followed by a three-man crisis suit squad also with cyclic ion blasters and four shield drones, a singular piranha, two riptides with um, ion accelerators and plasmas, a two sky ray gunships, and then three stealth suits and two units of two tetras. Um, pretty stereotypical uh, Tau list minus the Riptides. Um, everything else in there is pretty, pretty on the nose for current Tau. So wrapping up the final mission of the event, as we're not going to be making top eight, uh, we get to play Purge the Foe, which is 8th edition 40k. You get 
your primary is you get four points for hold one, four points for hold more, four points for kill one, four points for kill more. Um, not great for Tyranids because we're we want to make spore mines to do our secondaries and those count as kills for our opponent. Um, so Tyranids are not super great at this. However, I am playing against Tau, so I finally take fixed for the first time of the event because I basically, he gives up like 40 bring it down points. Um, and then I went for, I was trying to decide between teleport homers and engage, and I opted for engage as my second uh, objective because I do have trigons and pyrovores and spore mines and rippers all just trash to get engaged with. Um, and Tim managed to go first. We were both kind of done, you know, this is mission six. We're at the very end. We both know we're not getting top eight. Uh, so I deployed everything on the line and Tim actually just matched me and we're like, well, we'll see who goes first. And Tim and Kenneth in the previous game had been joking that that's how Tim had been doing so well. He just went first every single game this tournament and uh, he picked up like half his opponent's army in the first turn. And well, he continued against me. Uh, we both deployed completely on the line and he got to go first. Uh, so he just shoved everything in my face, and what you're seeing right here is the end of his turn one. Uh, so he shoved everything forward and shot at both of my Maliceptors, but my Maliceptors were tanks and just took, like, no damage at all. And Tim basically completely whiffed. Uh, not not through, like, lack of wounds. I just made a ton of four-up invulns. Uh, as you can see, he put his Crisis Suits way too close to my Maliceptors, so they were minus one to hit. Um, normally, I'd kind of remind my opponent of that, but I honestly, I just kind of spaced it too until he selected them to shoot. And I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, you're, you're within six. Like, I had told him that at the beginning of the game when we were going over lists. Um, and we kind of wrote it off because I said, if you get within six of this guy, you're minus one to hit. So that's combat or, you know, if you decide to get really, really close. And then he decided to get really, really close. And that actually really hurt him because he's now hitting on fours, even with the buffs. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, made it where that unit, and obviously this is turn one, so he didn't get his uh, exemplar of the Kion off yet either. So yeah, my, my guys just lived. Uh, so then it became my turn one where my Neurolictor managed to or actually, he might have killed one Maliceptor. Sorry, now that we're looking at this. I think he did kill one of them, and the other one took very little damage. Um, but then on my turn one, uh, I fired every single gun into his Crisis Suits and managed to pick up all of them. Uh, so he just had his Cold Star left, and basically that I, I knew I had to kill that unit because that was the Exemplar of the Kion, and they will be able to delete anything in the game from turn two on. Um... And then my warriors went over and I had, uh, I decided to pop my two CP and show what this unit can do against a vehicle. And they just picked up a Riptide. So yeah, lethal hits against vehicles with crit hitting on fives and sustained hits and all of that fun stuff. Picked up a Riptide. Um, and yeah, finally got to show off what that unit can actually really do uh, against vehicles. Uh, then we go on to Tim's turn two, where he does pick up uh, two monsters. I believe it was my other Maliceptor and a Trigon that... <laughs> uh, the Trigon he actually killed in my turn two. Uh, it basically charged into two Tetras. Um, yeah, actually, I think we probably... That Bring It Down should be on turn three. Because my Trigon charged Rapid Ingress in, he shot it, put it down to one wound on his turn two. Yeah. Um, sorry, his turn two, I declared Shadow in the Warp. That's what it was. Uh, I declared Shadow in the Warp on his turn two, and Battle shocked half his army. Um, and then charged my Trigon into his two Tetras. And on his turn, when he's falling back with his Tetras... Uh, that I put, I killed one and I put the other one down to one wound, but uh, the Tetra fell back and because it was battle shocked, he had to take a desperate breakout, rolled a one, it died, then it exploded and took the final wound off of the Trigon <laughs> uh, and killed that. So that was a really unfortunate way for the Trigon to go. 
but was hilarious. Um, other than that, he's firing all of his stuff into my guys, and like I said, I think he he killed uh, a exocrine or a maliceptor. There we go. Next picture kind of gives us more of an idea. Um, yeah, so he killed the Maliceptor and the Trigon in the top right and the Exocrine that had outflanked. Um, so between turn two and three, he picked up those three models. Um, that's how he got those nine points from Bring It Down. And basically then on my clapback, I had my uh, other squad of warriors outflank and... Um, they had rapid ingress in and basically managed to make it into his broadsides and killed his broadsides. Uh, meanwhile, my other Trigon had um, charged into his Devilfish and Breachers, which I'd been tying up with a Pyrovore. Um, and yeah, this game really just was a big punch back and forth. Um, I He picked up all of my warriors that had killed his Riptide but then I killed his other Riptide with my um, all my Exocrine shooting. And it just was an absolute bloodfest. Uh, he was getting Killmore every single turn. So if you're looking at his primaries, um, like turn two, he had Holdmore and Killmore. Uh, turn three and four, he had Killmore. And then finally, on my turn four, I got Holdmore for the first time. Because we he was able to keep me to just hold one, kill one up until turn four um but yeah finally turn four i got hold more and then turn five what it came down to um at the end of the game we pretty much both maxed on secondaries and it came uh he had fully maxed on primary so what it came down to was him killing a trigon with which had one wound left yeah, so he'd, he'd already maxed primary, so it came down to killing a Trigon with one wound left, um, and then him not losing anything in return. And if he could do that and deny me kill and kill more, then he wins the game. Uh, so his once, and all he has left are two Tetras and a Sky Ray. Um, I have my, I still have an unmolested six man warrior squad, a Exocrine, the one wound Trigon, and a one wound Pyrovore. <laughs> um, if he manages to kill the Trigon and it explodes and kills the Pyrovore, that is also how he wins because then I can get kill, but I can't get kill more. Um, and then he wins by like two. But the Skyray goes over, fires three missiles into the Trigon, three hits, three wounds. I have a six up save and I roll three sixes to keep the Trigon alive with a single wound. Uh, so it doesn't actually matter. And I managed to get... Um, win the game there uh and i do manage to kill the sky ray with the warriors anyways so it ended up not mattering that the trigon rolled the triple sixes but i decided to finish the tournament in style uh winning the game 96 to 85 having beat the pairing up against tau which also had me just barely uh beat kenneth for best tyranids at the event very excited to do that because there was also um tyler bartell was also there uh another incredible uh, Tyranid player plays on Team America. Yeah, incredible player, but he had kind of poor luck with Endless Swarm this weekend. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, best Tyranids at Cali Cup. Very excited to, that, to have achieved that award. Um, and honestly, really happy with the list. The Trigons and Warriors performed excellently, and Maliceptors and Exocrines did what they always do. So, I didn't feel the lack of a hive tyrant really that much so was kind of happy about that and the only thing i think i'd really change i don't know if i need a second trigon one is great two is nice redundancy um i did feel like i had more trash than i needed but i don't have the points to turn that trash into something actually useful so i i honestly i think i love the list and yeah great showing let me know what you guys think of the video if you stuck it out this long really appreciate it and like I said, I will be making another one uh, in the future uh, going over my Vanguard detachment that I played at the Hobbytown. Um, that one was super fun.